My name is uh, Bill Mumley. Uh, my wife and I came to Kenya in 1988 with our three children. Uh, we felt called by the Lord with our organization, and that's Campus Crusade for Christ, which is the parent organization of Life Ministry. And that was the ministry how, that led me to the Lord. And so when I was in university, I was at Penn State University in the United States. I had many questions about many things, but the summary statement of what I was asking was, what's the scoop? Which in American phrases simply means, what's right, what's wrong, what's true? I didn't know what was true. I decided there was no God. I decided in my studies in high school that God was something that was made up so that it would give artificial uh, meaning to life and artificial authority to the rules. And so once I discovered, once I decided there was no God, I began to say, so what is my life about? And I had a hundred questions about a hundred things, but it all boiled down to that one question, what's a scoop? Uh, finally, I got to the point where my life became so empty that I sat down and decided to write my definition of what my meaning in life was. And so I, this is what I wrote. My meaning in life is to make myself as comfortable as possible while I'm waiting to die. Now, I didn't like that definition, but it's the only one that I could think, think, was, think up that was made sense. Life had no meaning. So I began to read philosophy books. And the philosophy books would sound good, and then I read another one, it would disagree, and, 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 and it would make sense, but it would disagree with the other one. And I thought, all these really brilliant men are saying really brilliant things, but they don't agree, no one knows. Is there anybody that has the authority to say they know what is right, and is there anybody that is right and can say, I know, the, I know what's right, and these other guys are wrong, and that I could believe? So about this time, I began to read the Bible, uh, just because I was looking at Jesus, not so much as a religious figure, but just as a wise man. So I began to read from Jesus, and one day, the apostle Thomas, was talk, the disciple Thomas, was talking to Jesus, and he said to him, Lord, what is the way? And I remember thinking, that's my question. What's the scoop? Thomas was asking, in first century language, my American question, what's the scoop? So I said, what's Jesus going to say? I put my hand over the Bible, and I thought, he's going to say, obey the Ten Commandments. He's going to say, love your neighbor. Something that makes sense, something that's reasonable, but really does not answer my question. But when I took my hand away from the Bible and looked down, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I realized he was claiming to be that man I was looking for that could say, I, my opinion matters more than everyone else's. And he was not a crazy man. I knew he wasn't a crazy man. I knew he wasn't a liar. And I thought, he's making that claim. Maybe it's true. And so I began to look into his life. Finally, I went to the University of Penn State. I went to every Christian meeting I could find. If it had Jesus in the poster, I wanted to, to go. And so, but no one was telling me how I could know Jesus. They were good people. I liked what they were saying. They had good teaching. But no one was telling me how I could know Jesus. And finally, I went to a Campus Crusade meeting. And I'm sitting in the Campus Crusade meeting. And at the time, I was a smoker. I used to smoke cigarettes as a university student. And I decided in the middle of the Christian meeting, I'm going to light a cigarette. Not to be defiant or to be rebellious. I just wanted these people to know, I'm an outsider. Please tell me how I can know Jesus. I really wanted to know. And so I was smoking, and afterwards I saw a guy come walking to me. He sat down next to me, and he started talking to me. And he pulled out the Four Spiritual Laws booklet. And he shared the Four Spiritual Laws booklet with me. And, and, and I, as he went through law one, God loves me. Law two, I'm, I'm separated from God because of my sin. Law three, Jesus died for my sins. Law four, I just need to receive him into my life to be my savior and give me eternal life. And he would, he would reconcile me with God and I would know the truth and I could grow in the truth and understand what life was all about. And I, so that day, I received Christ as my savior. And it made all the difference in the world. 
And I decided, it, it was short, two, two years later I graduated. I was very active in Campus Crusade ministry as a student. I decided to go into uh, ministry full time because I was so excited about that. So I joined the staff. I worked in the campus ministry in America for um, about 10 years. And then um, we started going to Campus Crusade conferences and they were talking about missionaries. And, I, and they were talking about going to places like Eastern Europe and Africa. And those were the two that were interesting to me. And when I heard about what was happening in Africa was many people were coming to Christ, but what they needed was discipleship. Uh, they needed discipleship and building up of the body. And I thought, that's what we like to do. We like to, to talk to people who like, want to hear the gospel, and then we want to follow them up. We want to, and so the phrase in Campus Crusade is win, build, send. And so we, and, and Africa, uh, Africa, and at that point, Africa was just Africa. I didn't know there was Kenya and Uganda and Senegal and South Africa and how different Africa is depending on where in Africa you are. But I wanted to go to Africa, quote unquote. So I was assigned eventually to come to Nairobi. And so uh, my wife and I landed with our three children, uh, in fact, three and a half children, because Julie was expecting. Uh, she was due in six weeks when we landed at Jomo Kenyatta Airport. We had a two-year-old daughter, a, a four-year-old son, and a six-year-old son. And we arrived in, in at Jomo Kenyatta Airport, and Julie was expecting our fourth-born uh, six weeks later. And so he was born, and uh, I was told during our training, when you first go into another country, the first year, don't expect to lead. Don't expect to be in charge. Just go with your ears open and your eyes open and your mouth shut. And that's what they trained us in, in the cross-cultural uh, preparation for coming here. So we were ready. We're just going to learn about Kenya. And this was Kenya, not Zimbabwe. It was Kenya, a different than Zimbabwe, different from Uganda. And so we were in Nairobi. So we get off the plane in the tarmac and we're walking towards the airport and we see st students standing with signs. Welcome to our director. And so we realized they were welcoming a director and, and Julie, my wife, turned to me and said, is he also on our plane? This, this director they're talking about? He must be also on the plane. Well, what we discovered is that was me. Now, I wasn't the national director. I was the campus ministry director, a department of Life Ministry Kenya. And so I discovered on day one that I am the, the campus director. I know nothing about Kenya. I know nothing about Nairobi. I know nothing about the University of Nairobi, but I'm the boss of the campus ministry. And so it was a very big surprise. But what I didn't realize was that there were a core of students at the University of Nairobi, many of them holding those signs. Timothy Mwangi, Kiruhi, uh, Stanley Chege, Kagunda. I know these are all Kikuyus, but let's see, there uh, Munengi Mulandi, uh, Arnold Nzova, um, a guy named Nicholas Otieno, uh, I'm trying to, Bob Kikuyu, even though his name was Kikuyu, he was from Western, he was Luya, and so, uh, and some other really wonderful students. And I got to know them, and I realized these are, and I don't remember the women as much because I didn't work closely with women, and that was 30 years ago. My wife would have to tell you those, and, uh, but, uh, and some of the other staff. So I, as I met with these students, I realized uh, these are serious people. They're serious about Jesus. And, uh, and as I began to work with them, I began to, I realized, because I didn't know anything, I realized something very important. I didn't know anything about Kenya. So I said to them, I can tell you what I know. You tell me what you know. And, and, when, and how to do it. This is what I did at the University of Arkansas. This is what I did at the University of Minnesota in the US. But how will that work in Nairobi? Because I know it's different here. And so that turned out to be a very wise, the, Lord, the Spirit was leading me at that time. And so Mwangi had great ideas, Molandi had great ideas, Stanley Chege had great ideas, Oliambo had great ideas. And so all these things, they would, they would take these ideas, we implement them on the campus, and so we decided to do a number of things. Um, one of the first things we did was we invited a speaker to come. And uh, his, he was from America, 
Um, we had to set it up at Taifa Hall. That was very difficult. The Lord answered our prayer. Maybe I should tell a story about that one. I learned something about Kenya. I went in and asked permission to use Taifa Hall for this big outreach we were planning to do with Rusty Wright, evangelistic outreach. And they told me no, because they said they already had a, a particular ministry on campus that all the Christian activities would take place under that Christian ministry. And if we wanted to do it, we'd have to do it under that Christian ministry. Well, I, I, I knew that would be difficult. I knew there'd be some uh, roadblocks there. So I said, oh, is there any way that uh, we can just make an exception this time just for... So then my daughter, who at that point was about four years old, looked around the corner. And I was, she was just sitting out in the hallway waiting for me. And I said, Joelle, be right there. Her name was Joella. And Joella, um, she said, tell, tell, come, come, come. Her name was Mrs. I hope I can say her name. Yeah, it's, it's, I, 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 I'm going to honor her so I can say her name. Her name was Mrs. Akaranga. And she was the administrator that was in charge of the Taifa Hall. She had the authority to tell me whether we could use it. And we've been praying, Lord, give us Taifa Hall. We need Taifa Hall. It's the biggest hall on campus. We have this big speaker coming. And we had a, a, a publicity campaign that I'll tell you about in a moment. And so uh, Joelle came in, sat on my lap. And the, Mrs. Akaranga had some, had some, went some sweets, and so Joelle went around, and Mrs. Akaranga put her on her lap and gave her some sweets. And just enjoyed, it, it became very friendly, it became very less official, it became more personal. She asked me about my family, I asked her about her family, and pretty soon she took out her pen and she said, you can have Typho Hall, and she gave it to me. And I realized this is a relational culture. And it's about friendship, it's about being human, it's not just about official paper logic. And so, so anyway, we got Taifa Hall. And so here's what we did with one of our first key ministries at the University of Nairobi with these, these core leaders that we found. Um, we decided to put uh, signs around campus, but the strategy that we came up with was to start out by not telling them very much. It just said, Rusty is coming. They didn't even know Rusty was a name. You know, Rusty's coming. All, that's all it said. We, we printed up hundreds of, of posters, just black and white posters, put them in the residence halls, put them on telephone poles, put them on trees all throughout campus. And pretty soon people are saying, what is this? Rusty's coming. Who's Rusty? Who's Rusty? And we could hear people asking, who's Rusty? And, uh, and then the second phase, after the, the, we tore those signs down, hear Rusty, H-E-A-R, hear Rusty. And then I would be walking through the residence halls, and by then, the Life Ministry staff, and most of us on official staff, we had key, we had key student leaders that I've already talked to, talked to you about, but our staff were all Mzungu, Wazungu. We were all from USA. And so there were six of us, seven of us. And so whenever they'd see a Mzungu walking through the hall at that time, um, they'd say, hey, Rusty. I mean, maybe it's a cuckoo accent, I don't know, but I'd hear, Irasti. And, uh, and so I knew that this, the message was getting out. So then we'd put up posters and we'd keep adding details. Rusty's coming these dates. Rusty's coming these dates, Taifa Hall. Rusty's coming these dates, Taifa Hall, the title of the message. And so we did um, uh, Maximum Relationships was one of the talks. Uh, uh, the other talk was, um, Something about the afterlife. Uh, something about the afterlife, and then there was a third talk. So the first night at Taifa Hall, it was so packed, the aisles were filled with people sitting. There were big, giant windows on the side of Taifa Hall with big window sills. Students sitting in the window sills. It, the place was packed. It had a capacity of about 400. I think there were 600 people there, 700 people there. And it was just people were standing room only. And so what our strategy was is that he would speak, he would offer an invitation to receive Jesus, and then we'd hand out comment cards. What did you think of the meeting? Did it make sense to you? Did you receive Jesus Christ as your savior tonight? Would you like to talk to someone more about this? And they would sign their name and, or put their name and their room number because they were all, mostly all university students. We got hundreds of contacts. And so for the next six months, we were following people up. We go knock on the door. We're here because you filled out this form. Can we talk to you? And many people came to Christ. Uh, many people who were already Christians decided to get involved with our discipleship. And so pretty soon, the, the, we had a weekly meeting, which we called Prime Time. And it would meet at the old Nairobi Chapel 
on the middle of campus. Now, Nairobi Chapel is a big movement now, but back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, it was just a small chapel in the middle of the university. Um, and so we, they let us use their building on Wednesday night. So, and we had prime time. We would put prime time posters over campus. When I, we first got there, there were about 40 students. Then when these, these core students began to organize into these kinds of outreaches, um, it went from 40 to 60 to 80 to 100. Within a few years, there were over 300 students in our, in our weekly meeting, sometimes 400. And, uh, and they were, many of them were sharing their faith. We were training them how to share their faith. We had training seminars where we would teach people how to win people to Christ, how to build them up in their faith, and how to send them out to become people who win, build, send as well. So this multiplication process would begin to happen. And our movement began to grow. Um, and then I remember when I first came, I met with Wellington Matiso, who was the national director at the time, Wonderful man, I'm still a good friend with him. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him. But here's what he told me, and I don't think he'll mind me telling you this. He said, Bill, you're my campus director. And I said, yes, I've been told that. I'm a bit surprised, but yes, I'm your campus director. And then he said, I don't want a campus director. And he was a very honest man. Anybody who knows Wellington knows he just speaks his mind. And I said, why? And he said, because we need staff. We need, we need, we have too many Americans. We love the Americans, we're grateful they're here, we're grateful for missionaries, but we need to develop Kenyan staff. We need to recruit people on staff and we're simply not going to get them from the university because the university students have so much expectation on them from their families to get high paying jobs out there to, to support the extended family, there's no way they're gonna raise support because our staff raise their own ministry support from, from team members who want to fulfill the Great Commission in Kenya and beyond who are willing to partner with our staff. And so I said, well, uh, we'll see what God does. And so um, Timothy Mwangi was a student I was working with. He was a sophomore in engineering, very serious with, with our ministry. He was, one, he was really the student leader. And he was the one that rallied around many of these other students. And so, uh, and, the, and basically the wisdom that came from the ministry did not come from me. I, I was there and I offered some things and some parameters and, some, and what worked in the US, but the wisdom came from these men and women that were the core. And so Tim Wangi was the leader among them. And, uh, and so uh, we began to, oh, he began to grow. He was working probably 30 hours a week in the ministry and he was an engineering student, which is very demanding. He graduated with a first class in engineering, and he said to me, I think God is leading me to join Life Ministry staff full time. And so he had to go talk to his parents. He was offered four high paying jobs, including Unilever, that's the only one I remember, Unilever and other, other large international companies to come work for him as an, as an engineer. Very good salary and he turned them all down to join Life Ministry staff. But he innovated something that w was revolutionary at the time. Because we were, the ministry was largely influenced by um, an Amer the American parenting company, we had policies about raising support, and he said, may I raise support to help my nieces and nephews go to, to, go to school? I said, no, you can't, because if they're your own children, if they're your sons and daughters, yes, but not your cousins, not your nieces and nephews. And he said, you know what, Bill, in this culture, that's important. And so I listened to him, and I finally, by this time, George Mambaleo had become the national director. Um, George Mambaleo had become very close to Julia and I. He became our cultural insider. He would help us along the way. There's some stories about George that I'll also tell. But, uh, but at this time, Mwangi said, can we change the policy to allow me to raise extra support so that I can help fund my extended family? So he said, when I'm talking to a doctor who wants to support me, and I tell him I graduated from the University of Nairobi, but I'm in the ministry, first thing he's gonna ask me is, how are you gonna take care of your, 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 your family? And by family, he didn't mean, he meant extended family. And he said, now I have an answer for them. So we changed the policy. And he was able to raise all his support, and so he was our breakthrough. 
Um, and so Wellington Matisso later said to me, you were right. There were university students who can come on staff. And so Tim was our first one. The following year, we had five came on staff, five joined staff, including, um, let's see, who, who is it? It was Stanley Chege uh, Kagunda, uh, Bob Kikuyu, Justice Kamau. Um, I think this was the year um, uh, that Mulandi came on. Might, Mulandi might have come on a year or two later, but he was one of the early ones. Um, and then there was a fifth guy that I can't remember. Uh, Magangi, a guy named Mag John Magangi. He went on to be a pastor. He may still be a pastor in Nairobi. John Magangi. So those were the big five. They called them the big five, like the animals. The big five. And people began coming to our campus to say, how are you recruiting people from university? And so, and so I'd say, talk to them. Talk to these men, because they, they're, they're the ones that have the wisdom. And so, <clears throat> so the ministry grew, um, and a lot of exciting things happened. And... Uh, over the years, many people came on staff so that this day, there's a large contingent of, of leaders in life ministry um, that are current leaders. And I'll give you one example, an important one. Timothy Mwangi was a guy I discipled. But he discipled a core of men, which included two men that became national directors for life ministry Kenya. So Timothy Mwangi discipled a guy named Eric Wafucho. I learned to say his name correctly. It means mole or something. I grew up something, you know, Eric Alfuha. So he'll be happy to hear me say his name, although I didn't say it well that time. But, uh, and um, Arnold Nzova. So Arnold Nzova, Eric Fuko, Rafuko became the national director of life ministry, oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. I forget how long. And he was a national director for a while. He was the one responsible for this building. And, uh, and so it's, it turns out to be a very powerful legacy that he left behind. Uh, he's now in government. I think he has a, he's a, has a government position somewhere in Western Kenya, and uh, where he's from. Uh, and then there's Arnold Nzova. Arnold Nzova was actually a bit quiet as a student. I, I don't know if he minds me sharing. He was a bit quiet, but he was, con he, he was a good discipler. He would disciple people. He was faithful in evangelism. He was one of staff. So he joined Life Ministry staff back in the 90s, I think it was. Yeah, back in the 90s. And, uh, and so today, he's the National Director of Life Ministry Kenya. And so that's only one of the legacy. Uh, Munenge Molandi is now senior pastor at Nairobi Baptist Church. Nicholas Courier was led to the Lord by Justice Kamau. Mwangi discipled Justice Kamau also, but then he turned him over to me. So then for a while, I, actually, you know what? I, I had justice from the beginning. I led justice to the Lord. Justice Kamau, I led him to the Lord in, in Choromo. He, he came on staff. He it was, a, for a very brief time, took over my, my role as the campus director when I moved to, I started teaching at our theology school called Nairobi International School of Theology back in the 90s. And I turned because these men were now becoming mature. And I decided they need to take over these leadership responsibilities. So for a brief time, Justice Kamau became uh, campus director. They asked him to go become the national director of Botswana. So he was actually Life Ministries national director for Botswana for a number of years, did a wonderful job, and then became a missionary to, to Korea, and, and recently returned to Kenya. And he was with Life Ministry for a while, but now he has a law degree and he's practicing law. But uh, um, so Justice Kamau led a young student at Kenyatta University named Nicholas Courier to the Lord. Discipled him, mentored him, and now Nicholas Courier is the senior pastor at Nairobi Chapel. Um, and so the legacy of this campus ministry is going on even today, and, there's, and even in other countries. Um, uh, later, I think it was even Arnold that discipled uh, George Arudo. And George Arudo is now in Zambia. He's been in Zambia for a long time. He has a leadership position with Life Ministry in Zambia. Um, uh, boy, I wish I could think of some other names. Uh, I'm sure other people will be giving testimonies about these names. But uh, when I look back, people ask me often, what's the greatest thing that you saw when you were in Kenya? And I always have the same answer. Because the greatest thing that I saw in Kenya we saw a lot of events, we saw a lot of missions, which I can also share about. Um, but the biggest thing that I saw in Kenya were name, I can only name names. 
and the names I've already named. Timothy Mwangi is now the Vice Chancellor of ILU, doing a fabulous job. Meningi Malandi is now Senior Pastor at Nairobi Chapel. I mean, I'm sorry, Nairobi Baptist. Nick Career is now the Senior Pastor at Nairobi Chapel. Um, Kagunda has a, has a consulting agency now which, which mentors and coaches Christian leaders. Um, uh, and, and I could go on and on. But uh, so it's people. It's the people that we raised up that became leaders. And what happened was at the begin at those early days, most of the ministries were being run by Americans. It was a Wazungu ministry back in 1988. But over the years, what we saw was men and women that were being win, build, send. And as we sent them out, they became stronger and stronger. They began to win, build, send. They began to win, build, send. And so pretty soon, we as Wazungu began to recognize we've got to give the leadership over uh, to people, these men and women who are more qualified than us. Uh, I should, I went, there's one story I need to tell about my own personal experience. About three years in, about three years in, I come to the US, I'm fairly well educated, uh, from, come from a first world country, I come to a third world country called Kenya. And it's a third world country, and so you have this attitude when you are a f come from the first world and you go to the third world. And frankly, part of it is sinful. Part of it is, I think I have advantages that these guys don't have. And there are advantages that are embedded in me. And I was talking with um, Mwangi Karuhi, Tim, Tim Karuhi. I have some Agri Madahana. Some more names are coming to me. Agri Gumia, he was from Uganda. And Ken Kaduki. Ken Kaduki is now the head of the physics department at Teromo campus. Um, and so I was talking with them. And after the Bible study was over, I'm their leader. I'm just a few years older than them. But I had this feeling of superiority, frankly. It's a confession. I'm confessing my sin. I've repented. So the Lord's forgiven me. But that's what I was like back then. I thought, you know, I know I'm a pretty smart guy. Um, I, um, I think I, I was sort of felt, I felt superior. So I'm we're talking about theology. We're talking about uh, science. We're, we're, we're talking about politics. We're talking about philosophy. And I'm looking around the room. And I'm hearing these guys talk to each other. And I hear them talking to me. And I said to myself, which is a slight swear word, but I hope it's forgivable. I said, oh my God, I'm the dumbest guy in the room. And I was surprised. And then I was surprised I was surprised. And I thought to myself, why am I surprised that these guys are so smart? And I thought, because I just assumed that because I came from America, and these guys were Kenyans, that I should be the smartest guy. And I'm not. And it changed my whole perspective about Kenya, about particularly Kenya, but I, I think I said probably true for everywhere in Africa. What give, what, why did I think that? And so, so suddenly I realized these men and women are going to be leaders. These men and women are going to be able to do way better than me because not only can they, they're smarter than me and they can do the ministry as good as me, but they understand Kenya like I will never understand Kenya. They understand the culture, they understand the background, they have grandfathers and great-grandfathers that, grew, that grew, up, grew here, and they know the nuance in the subtleties of what the beliefs are and what the assumptions are, and they're, they're gonna be able to take the gospel much more effectively. And so I left Kenya three years ago but I really left leadership uh, around 2002. I went to, I started to be, I went to be a teacher at the, at the Nairobi International School of Theology, which is now the International Leadership University. I eventually got my doctorate, but I stopped leading around 2002, 2003, turned the leadership over to them. Since that time, the ministry fruitfulness, the ministry effectiveness, the ability of people to win people to Christ, build them up in their faith, and, and send them out to each other's has so much better than it ever was under the missionaries. So I'm grateful I was a missionary. I'm thankful for the other missionaries, but I'm very grateful that the, the, what's happening now is all 
run by highly qualified, wise, godly men and women who are from Kenya. And that's where we are today.